President Obama recently visited Cuba. This has been a new development in U.S. foreign policy. No doubt this would be part of the legacy of both Raul Castro of Cuba and President Barack Obama here in the United States. For many years, since the Cuban Revolution in 1959, the relations between Cuba and the United States has been turbulent. There is existing, presently, for many years, an embargo on Cuba. However, there is now diplomatic relations. There is a U.S. Embassy in Havana, and the Cuban Embassy here in Washington has lowered the Swiss flag, and the Cuban flag is now in the air. What would this new development mean for the relationship between the United States and Cuba in the future? Will it remove the embargo? Stay tuned. Carp Nation is up next to discuss in detail the implications of this new development in Cuban-American relations. What are you going to do to end violence against women? I am a woman. I am fearless. I am strong. I am a positive spirit. I am blessed. I am desperate. As women, we need to remember that we are strong and we are in charge of ourselves. If we want to end violence, we as women need to be empowered. Empowering yourself and others that look up to you, empowering your children, you know, passing on that baton to your kids, your daughters, more or less, and letting them know that, listen, being empowered is very important. Become that empowered statement as you walk through life. Unite. End violence against women. Welcome to Carb Nation. Today we are discussing Cuban-American relations. As we are aware for many years, even though Cuba is a very small country, a few miles away from the United States, Cuba has been at the center in more ways than one in controversy between the U.S. and Latin America and U.S.-Cuban relations. We remember, for example, during the Kennedy administration, when the world was at edge regarding the possibility of a nuclear war in which Cuba was at the center. The Cuban Revolution and the democratic system of the United States have been clashing for many years. But now, today, there has been a new development in that President Obama, President of the United States, has been to Cuba and has opened relations with that country. And there is hope that this will lead to exchanges between the American people and the Cuban people, and that it would lead to a reopening in the Cuba and relations between Cuba and the United States. We have with us today two guests who will discuss the implications of this relation and what it will mean for the Cuban people, the Cuban Revolution, and the United States. James Early, who is associated with the Smithsonian Institution for many years, and Netfa Freeman, who works with the Institute of Policy Studies. Welcome, gentlemen. James, let's start with you. Let's talk a bit about this new deal between the United States and Cuba. What happened? How is it that relations have been reestablished? What is the story there? It's a big story. It is a big story, and unfortunately, uh, the mainstream press uh, does not get to the heart of that story. The heart of that story is that the Cuban people uh, in their resistance and their transformation over the last 50 years of sustaining their own independence, their own self-determination, uh, suffered tremendously uh, against the attack of empire, the attempt to assassinate their political leaders, uh, the poisoning of their food crops, of their animals, the shoot down of their planes, the bombing of hotels, uh, the distortion of uh, Cuban socialist democracy by saying that the Cuban people uh, were under a dictator and could not speak. That is all untrue, but so the real story is the strength of the Cuban people and how they then organize the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as other areas of the world like the European Union, to leverage the United States 
back into the protocols of nations. The United States has been the renegade nation uh, with this illegal uh, blockade against Cuba, uh, with these extraterritorial threats against Cuba. And so all of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, across the ideological and political spectrum came to an agreement that this hemisphere could not function in a standard way uh, unless Cuba was recognized as a full partner. So the new community of Latin America and the Caribbean nations uh, excludes uh, Canada and the United States. It's a sign of the strength emerging in the Caribbean uh, and in Latin America and a declining um, effect of U.S. empire in forcing people to do what they wanted to do. So uh, that's the largest story uh, is that the Cuban people have succeeded uh, to get the United States back into the protocols of nations where countries pursue their mutual interests and they also pursue their ideological and political debates. And so I think that's really the main story. So Nepa, how, as a young African American here in the United States, how do you view the benefits to the United States from improve, this new improved relations with Cuba? The benefits are yet to be seen. I think they are steeped in a lot of the achievements that the Cuban Revolution has been able to have, particularly in the, in the uh, realms of health care and literacy. And these are kind of things that people are challenged with in the inner cities in the United States. Um, and also how uh, they facilitate uh, discussions, general discussions around populations and things like that. These are things that are largely missing in the United States when it comes to uh, democracy and tackling the social, uh, social ills of the day. Um, and so right now, we don't, we're not seeing anything. We're talk, they're talking about normalized relations, but the negotiations are still in the process and there's still a lot to be done. Um, and so there's still a blockade in force, uh, contrary to what people think. And under that condition, there's really not a normal relationship. So there are negotiations for normal relationships. And I think um, there's a whole lot to be said about um, a society that's ordered on looking at, uh, looking at the, the value in people and not, not profit, not putting those things up front. And this country is completely opposite. And so we would be able, we would be able to learn a lot from, um, from that uh, situation. Well, very interesting. And I'll get back to the nitty gritty of the politics in America. Well, let's talk about that a bit. Um, how was Obama able, and Secretary of State uh, Kerry able, to give leadership on a rapprochement with Cuba within the limitations that they have done it, considering that the Congress of the United States is at the level of the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, Republicans, and also the Cuban lobby, uh, which has been very strong in isolating Cuba. How did that politics play out, and who, how did Obama and Kerry give leadership to be able to reach where they were able to reach? Well, I think quickly a number of factors. One, the Cubans have always said, we are willing to talk about anything at any time with one condition. You must respect our independence and self-determination and our sovereignty. The Cubans have not been afraid of entering into the debates that the United States tries to undermine with them, uh, undermine them with the issues of, of human rights that the United States uh, wants to raise with Cuba or how Cuba's political system works or, or socialist democracy. The Cubans said, we're open to talking about any of that, but you must respect us. You're not going to put, that's one factor. The second factor, and very important, I think, for U.S. citizens to consider in the now establishment of diplomatic relations, and as Nefra Freeman has pointed out, the setting up of diplomatic relations is not the same as the normalization of relations, but it is a major step forward, which is a context that the Cubans have wanted to handle this engagement with the United States. U.S. citizens across the ideological and political spectrum, I think, must take some pride in that they have voted for a normalization of relations with Cuba for very different reasons, but nevertheless, so we can't put this on Obama or Kerry as individuals. Mm -hmm. Obama ran both times to the presidency saying, I will take up the issue of getting rid of this embargoes. So in that regard, he is expressing the will of the American people. Mm -hmm. again, again, that will is informed by different ideological and political objectives. It, it's a mistake as we often do, too frequently do in the United States and in most places in the world, think that politics is the personification of one individual. Uh, it is the citizens that call for this. And so we now have a better position of people-to-people -people relations as citizens in the United States. We're able to travel a bit more freely. 
uh, we have diplomatic relations, but as Netra has pointed out, the Cubans are very clear that the normalization of relations can only occur with the ending of this blockade, which has, the United States uses that blockade to penalize other countries, not just Cuba, other countries that want to do work with Cuba. So I think that's a different narrative that we need to embrace uh, in the United States, whether we're Democrats, Republicans, atheists, uh, socialists, Green Party, whatever, we, if we voted for the normalization of relations, for the freedom of the Cuban Five, we must take some credit that Obama is carrying out what we expressed as opposed to yeah, what others who voted against him. But I would add to that, though, that in terms of the, uh, the, the dominant politic in this country and in terms of the policy makers, there is still this, um, this, this mindset of having to influence and change Cuba. So and this is the other thing is that they're talking about uh, the blockade and the embargo as having failed failed to do, c carry out their objectives. Those objectives haven't changed. Right. So they're seeing this as a way, another different way of, of doing some, not doing the same thing they've been doing for over 50 years, almost 60 years, of trying to influence and, and uh, overthrow the Cuban Revolution. So we have to, like as James said, there's a number of uh, different uh, people with different interests in looking at this differently, uh, wanting the same thing but for different reasons. And so some of those who want the same thing are wanting it because they want to have hold and free reign in Cuba um, as they do in other places around the world. And so, but, and as uh, we also remember, talked about the, the, uh, the will of the people, the people have seen that it, the, when you really understand uh, the U.S. policy toward Cuba, it makes no sense whatsoever. And so when they're, the things that they uh, profess as being the reasons, they, they have double standards when they look at Saudi Arabia who has no elections, these kind of things, where Cuba does have elections, they don't want us to know, but they have relationships with countries that would be considered, that should be considered a dictatorial and have or human China. rights violations and things like that. So people can see this, and so at some point it becomes a very, it has become a very unpopular uh, position. Fidel Castro said the revolution has endured and that it still provides cultural and social products for its people. You all have been to Cuba, uh, you've been many years to Cuba. Talk to us a bit, what are these cultural products? What are these social products? Uh, it's very interesting because we are not talking about economic products. Yeah, I too have been reading the detailed summaries of the 7th uh, Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba, and which uh, Fidel Castro just addressed. Uh, first of all, I think we have to recognize that Cuban social and cultural policies have been very strong. They have produced some of the most educated people in the world. Of the 7 billion people walking the planet, there are 11 million Cubans. If you ask the United, the United Nations departments that study uh, pedagogy, uh, that study what children are doing in science and math, mm -hmm. Cuban children score higher than many of the developed countries. Uh, the Cuban infant mortality rate is lower than that of the United States uh, of America. Uh, leading uh, musicians uh, of the world's uh, three major ballets, uh, the Russians, uh, the, the French of four, the British, uh, the Cubans uh, have a sui generis ballet that is world class. And I could go on and on, uh, three, they, they're one of the leading countries in biotechnology. This is a result of the will of the Cuban people to dedicate their uh, energies towards social justice, uh, free education, uh, free health care. Now by their own omission, uh, their economy, they have failed in uh, many areas of their economy having a lot to do with the embargo, but not totally with the embargo. When Raul Castro uh, assumed the presidency when he was voted in by the National Assembly to be president of the country, he wasn't just handed over to his brother, didn't say, <laughs> hey, you now are the president. <laughs> right. That went through a voting process. Um, uh, one of the very first things he said is, if this blockade were removed tomorrow, we are in still deep trouble by our own errors, our own failures in the context of the extraordinary positive development that we have had. And, and as Fidel Castro said in his closing speech to the Congress, he said, with will for social justice and people-centered interest, you can produce what you need and sustain yourself in a solidarity so that the Cuban people have suffered together, notwithstanding whatever the differentials in their incomes, their housing circumstance, uh, they had a unified country that said, this is our country. 
these are our achievements, these are our errors, you cannot impose on us from the outside. So I, I, that's again a narrative that you will not hear mm -hmm. in the mainstream press, whether it's right wing or right. liberals, because the assumption of the United States of America, we are notwithstanding some very important things that we've provided for humanity as a country, we're an extremely arrogant country that says if you don't do it like we say it should be done, then you're outside the pale of humanity. And the Cubans, have, and this is why they are so loved in the Caribbean and Latin America, even by small capitalist countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, non-socialist countries, because the Cubans have dared to be independent and self-determined. And they have done some extraordinary things. And I think between now and 2030, because the four plans of the Communist Party meeting, the 7th Congress, uh, one of them was economic development towards 230. And they are very clear that their enemy is capitalism. They are not going to allow capitalism to be restored. They are very self-critical about over-centralization and the need to l set a context for these highly educated citizens to express their imagination and their creativity as patriots to not only advance their individual selves, but in a solidarity with their fellow citizens. So this is another kind of narrative that I think that we in the United States need to become more familiar with. So what were the other pillars of the Congress? Uh, well, very, very interestingly, and Netto may have been reading about this as well, very, this was the first time uh, in, since the 1959 revolution that they have di discussed the concept of the social and economic model of Cuba. That, that's a statement from them. And you would think, Fidel Castro in 2005 said, you know, the greatest error that we have made is uh, we thought someone knew how to just pick up a book or something and build socialism. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was being very honest and humble. He's saying, we are socialists. He's saying, I, and he's saying, I, Fidel Castro, am a communist. And I think that is the way that we should go. But we have to build this road as we walk it. You can't pick up a textbook. Right, no and he said, you know, in our early years, we thought point. we understood it. But that's an honesty uh, about errors and failures in the context of obvious strengths that they have developed. You know, they're one of the world's leading biotechnology uh, company, uh, countries with at what least three vaccines? vaccines against cancer, mm -hmm. uh, which pharmaceuticals are Hepatitis, dying to get into yeah. Cuba to see if they could set up contractual relations. So, so th this, this, that, that was a second thing, the development issue, the concept of the economic and, and uh, social uh, model, uh, the role of the Communist uh, Party, that, where there was a lot of self-criticism, of saying that we have to be better public servants. Uh, we have to pay more attention to the strengths and imagination and creativity of ordinary citizens. Now, when have we heard the United States <laughs> was, government just saying, that. you know, we talk about unintended consequences, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which is a dishonest way, they, you know, including the black people who voted for these crime bills under Clinton, they knew they right, were locking right. up. They knew Tons of black doing. people. That were, these were not unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. These were very consciously intended. Consequences. So th those were two of the other of the four planks uh, that that they that they talked about. And they just uh, to conclude on this point, they've said that it will take more than two five-year plans. That's why they're looking to 2030 to really improve their economy by their own means, uh, to make sure that the state maintains socialism. Uh, that was the other plank. Uh, mm -hmm. But they are looking for innovation and flexibility uh, th rather than uh, they know exactly what they want to do. So in recent times, over the last decade, there has been an emergence in Latin America and the Caribbean about the Afro-Latino. Because Latin Americans historically were saying we're nationalists and they did not want to look at ethnicity, race, and class. Uh, and so forth. Uh, how are African, Afro Latin, Afro Cubans doing in Cuba? Are they having an opportunity to express themselves? And in Brazil and other countries there, and Venezuela, there has been uh, a, a growing um, interest and uh, articulation of that identity issue, specifically with respect to people of African origin. How is that evolving in Cuba? Uh, I've been following this. I write about it. Um, it's not the only thing I follow and write about in Cuba, but it is a very important question, not because I'm black, but because Cuba is significantly black and mestizo. In Latin America, I'm a mulatto, mulatto. or mestizo. Yeah. These are different socio-historical frameworks, so w I put these terms in quotation. On November 9th, during the Thanksgiving week, uh, Danny Glover, the actor, social activist, and I met with 
the Foreign Minister of Cuba, Bruno Rodriguez, and two members of his staff, and a senior member of the Institute for the Friends of the Cuban People, to talk about the UN decade uh, for people of African descent. Uh, Cuba, like most of Latin America, has always put class first and has talked about mestizaje, that we are mixed, we are not black or white, we are just Cuba. Well, inside Cuba, in the last decade or a little more, there has been a huge debate with among members of the Communist Party. Uh, it's not just a Communist Party position. There are very dark-skinned people who say, there is no racism here in Cuba. <laughs> there are very white people with green eyes, blue eyes, blonde hair, say, there is racism <laughs> here in Cuba. Uh, Esteban Morales Dominguez, uh, uh, you can find his blog online. Um, a black communist, 70-some years old, founded the Institute for the Cuba Study, U.S.-Cuba Relations, directed that institute for 18 years. He writes about this, Gloria Rolando's films. On Where is he based? Uh, he, these, all, all of these people are in Cuba. In Cuba, yeah. And uh, who don't want to leave Cuba. Yeah. All they want is more ability to travel, and they have more ability to travel, but they are not interested in living outside of Cuba. Yeah. They have Cuba major. Uh, in the Communist Party Congress, the Seventh Congress, there is a statement about we must do more about the issue of blacks and mestizos. So, Finally, I would say, if, if you can look at the Jose Aponte Committee, which was originally called the Jose Aponte, was called the, the Union of Artists and Writers Committee Against Racism and Discrimination. These are the Cubans' term. Then they changed it to call it the Jose Aponte Committee. I won't go into who Jose Aponte was, but a very important historical figure. They used the term racism, and they used the term discrimination, and they put it in their own socio-historical context. They're trying to figure out how to deal with this issue inside their context, not how to deal with it from the vantage point of the U.S. or from Brazil or other places. Um, I think they are still not up to where they should go, but the most important thing is what they think and say. They are not hiding it. They're dealing with it. They realize that this is a real fetter on society. The remittances that go back to Cuba, most of the people who left uh, because of the revolution did not look like us. They were quote-unquote white. Uh, they may or may not be anti-communist. Not all of them are anti-communist. Some of them left for economic reasons. Some of them mm -hmm. left out of real fear of not knowing what was going on. Some of them left for ideological and political reasons. But when they send money home, they're not sending money home to say, well, I'm not, I don't want any black people to have this. <laughs> I want my cousin, my uncle, my aunt. Well, their cousin, their uncle, and their aunt live in the same community as these black people, so some, the same buildings as they do. But the differentials are there, and Cubans are seeing who can develop small enterprises and who can put a roof on their house and buy a new car. So there very is a there is a healthy debate yeah. in my view about racism, but from their vantage point. Well, gentlemen, just one last final statement uh, by you all. I would like to know how you evaluate the, the impact of the visit of the President of the United States to Cuba, both in terms of the Cuban people and the American people. Can you Never give me your take on that. Um, I think it was a, I think it was a terrific thing to happen. Um, uh, it brought out a whole lot of things. One, it got us to it gave us a chance to see um, the reactions and the response by the Cuban people, those who are really paying attention. Um, a lot of uh, Twitter and social media and different things on on blogs from young people. Um, to really be able to, because some people have been concerned uh, that uh, the reproachment will mean uh, an encroachment of U.S. and capital and uh, just a run, running over of, of the socialist project in Cuba. But we can see that people are not as, you know, don't have, don't look at the U.S. as with rose-colored glasses or the President of the United States with rose-colored glasses. So it gives us an opportunity to see that. And also just to, um, it just solidifies in the hearts and minds of people in the United States that there should be an opening of the relationship and that it's coming. So it makes it much harder and difficult um, for, uh, for, for those who don't want to see it or wanted to see it a certain way to not comply with the ongoing wishes of the, of the people in the United States. And lastly, I would say, um, and this is more of a, hmm, how should I say this, maybe cynical, it, it, it exposed um, some, of the, some of the double standards and hypocrisy of the U.S. government. Um, one was just mentioning the, the press conference I told, told you about, about the political prisoners and things like that. And then I remember it was something that uh, 
President Obama, a, a comment that he made about wanting, uh, about saying that the Cuba should uh, have, accept the U.S. Uh, model for democracy or something like that, which also gave people, uh, gives people an opportunity to look and compare and see what there is in Cuba and what there is not, or what there is here and what there is not, talking about money and how money affects things here. Um, and also we saw responses by people like Fidel Castro wrote uh, something that was quite eloquent and, and very revealing, and also an article uh, I thought was very good by Ricardo Alicón, the former president of the Na National Assembly, that talked about political prisoners and the fact here that Leno Peretier, who represents the, the American Indian movement, is still in prison here, and so he was able to actually, uh, it gives people an opportunity to talk about what really is. And James, one, la one final uh, word? I think the Cuban people in general uh, welcome this. Uh, they really, they like uh, people from the United States. Uh, I think mm, they were yeah. also very proud that it was a black American president because they understand the issues of racism inside the United States and they understand it inside the hemisphere. Uh, once meeting with Fidel Castro at his home, he, as he was reading Songs of My Father, the autobiography of, uh, of uh, the president, uh, he said, this is a very serious man, a very important book. And then he said, I once was in politics. And the implication of that is you can have serious humanistic perspectives about justice and freedom, but when you get in the struggle of power within your own party, between parties, you find out really who you are. And I think he exposed that in the letter to, to Brother Obama, uh, where but, he went. Well, I called. think the Cuban government was very gracious in welcoming an enemy that they had defeated. We must remember the United States government has been very clear. Our policy to overthrow the Cuban Socialist Revolution has failed. It has isolated us in the international community. We now must change that policy to achieve the same ends. They were very gracious in welcoming this enemy mm -hmm. in a new battleground, and they have shown that. We can do drug interdiction together. We can do uh, hurricane abatement issues uh, together. We can have people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, we want to import a more, some food from you. We would like for you to open your markets for our biotechnology and other kinds of things. So the Cuban people are ready and willing to engage us as equals, but with respect. So it is a step forward, but the battle continues. Well, I look forward to Cuba and the United States deepening that relationship for the benefit of both people, culturally, socially, economically, and in a pluralistic ideological world. Sure. So thank you, gentlemen, once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us on Card Nation. This has been a very interesting discussion about Cuban-American relations. We look forward to the day when the embargo on Cuba will come to an end. Until next time, I'm Paul Nero Tennessee for Caribbean Nation.